Hello everyone. My name is Prasanna Balaprakash. I'm a computer scientist at Argon National Laboratory. Today I'm going to talk about our recent efforts in mapping and porting deep learning applications on Samba Nova AI architecture. A high level overview of Samba Nova software flow architecture is shown here. From the user perspective, the user writes the code or the neural network in PyTorch or TensorFlow. <clears throat> the data flow analyzer analyzes this graph. The data flow optimizer and assembler looks at various types of custom operations and the machine learning specific operations and map them on the AI hardware. The traditional GPU accelerator, if you look at it, there are a lot of data movement and the context switching. For example, if you take the convolution and pooling operation, it, if you know, a lot of uh, data from memory has to go into the cores and then for the convolution operation and then the context switching happens, the results are stored in the memory and the data and weights are moved back uh, into, the, into the cores and then this pooling operation happens and so on and so forth. Samanova addresses these two issues, that is the data movement issue and the context switching issue using the Samba Nova data flow execution. Here, the data from the memory enters into the so-called pattern memory unit and pattern compute unit. The convolution operation and the pooling operations are all sort of mapped and optimized on these uh, PMUs and PCUs. So the data will flow from convolution to pooling without going back into the main memory. By the time when we are doing, let's say, the convolution two, the second convolution operation, the other data sample that is required for convolution one can be pipelined and it is staged and it can be already operating at the convolution level, con convolution one layer. So consequently, there is no data movement from these PMUs and PCUs to the main memory and also the context switching doesn't happen as much as the traditional GPU accelerator. Next, I'm going to talk about three scientific deep learning applications and how we are mapping these applications on Samba Nova. The first one is gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing is a mind-blowing phenomenon that occurs in nature. So for example, if you, are, if you have a distant galaxy, as shown in the figure, and if you're looking at from the Earth, and even there is a heavy object in the path, this, this, um, the light can be bent because of this heavy object. And this is shown in the figure. This is shown in the figure. Next, I'm going to talk about three science applications and how we are mapping these applications on Samba Nova architecture. The first one is gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing is a mind-blowing, naturally occurring phenomena. In this, pheno in this, in this, in this phenomena, <clears throat> next I'm going to talk about three science applications and how we are mapping these applications on the Samba Nova architecture. Gravitational lensing Next I'm going to talk about three science applications and how we are mapping these applications on Samba Nova AI architecture. The first one is gravitational lensing. The gravitational lensing is a naturally occurring phenomena in which the light rays are deflected as they traverse through a curved space. And this curved space are caused by heavy object in their path. For example, this is shown here where you have the distant galaxy that is shown in the red and from the earth when we are observing and, there in, and when there is a heavy object in the path, then the light gets uh, bent. And this is what we observe from the earth. So it's the same light from the galaxy, from the distant galaxy, which is 
which appears at two different places, but they are all coming from the same galaxy. The galaxy-galaxy strong lensing is a phenomena in which the heavy object is another galaxy. To detect these type of phenomena from the telescopes that, that are pointed to, to the sky, we are developing a deep learning pipeline. So this pipeline consists of a number of uh, modules. The first module is denoising a module, which basically looks at the image from the telescope. And these images are often noisy. And the first module is to remove the noise from these images. The second module is deblending. So deblending is a is a is a process in which we remove the galaxy that is in front of the source galaxy. So this is shown here. The next step is detection. So this could be due to noise or this could be galaxy. So the detection process or the detection module basically identify whether this object is actually a, a strong lens object or it's just a noise. And the third and the, and the final uh, final module, the fourth module is a regression module, which is the lens modeling uh, module, which looks at these, um, these lensed images and identify what are the parameters of these uh, lensed uh, images, such as Einstein radius, axis ratio, and position angle. So we are not training this end-to-end -end in, a, in a completely data-driven way. The reason is that we have a lot of knowledge. In particular, we have simulations about the telescope, simulation about the ground truth, simulations about uh, the lens system. So the reason for building such a modular deep learning pipeline is that we can leverage the data from the simulation, such as the ground truth without any noise and ground truth with a separated source and ground truth um, of the lens system and, and train this deep learning pipeline in a modular way as opposed to, okay, start from a completely noised image and try to uh, identify the regression parameters and try to see if, if, if there is a lens or not. Uh, so this allows us to verify the, the, the accuracy of each and every module. And more importantly, we can leverage the data from the simulation uh, that is being developed by the domain experts over years. So once this module is trained in this way, then we can take the trained module and do the inference in an end-to-end -end way where we get the noise image and all we are trying to do is first to say whether it is a lensed image or not. And if it is a lensed image, then we do the regression. So Samanova provides a number of, uh, number of ways that we can optimize this modular deep learning pipeline for lensing. In addition to mapping the convolution layers as shown in the data flow, uh, engine, we are taking each module and then mapping this module into the PMUs and PCUs. Consequently, the data from the memory can enter into, into the data flow engine and it doesn't need to go back and forth between the memory and the, the, the result of the mod noise, um, uh, noise removal module goes into the denoising, uh, the, the, the noise removal module goes into the deblending module, the deblending module goes into the lens finding module. And finally, the results of the lens, lens detection module goes into uh, the regression module for finding the parameters of the lenses. Our second use case is on inversion of nuclear responses. The neutrino scattering experiment is, is one of the promising method to understand the nucleus of an atom. In this method, the scientists take a beam of particles and target at nucleus, and the scattering that is coming out of this experiment, um, either the, the, the beam and also the, the scattered nucleus, will allow them to understand what is the property of the nucleus. What we usually observe is something called response function that contains all the information on the structure and dynamics of the nucleus. So what you see here is on the x-axis, the strength of the beam and y-axis, the response. And this is a unique signature for different nucleus. For example, if you look at the oxygen atoms nucleus, it has a, this specific uh, structure of the a specific structure of response. Whereas if you go and look at the calcium 
atoms nucleus it has a different uh, different response the key challenge here is that often what the scientists observe is something called Euclidean response and what they are actually interested is the the original response and that is a uh, this this the relationship between these two is given by the integral of the Laplace transform so in order to get the response from the Euclidean response what they observe one needs to do this inversion often in many cases as as you know the inverse problem often have multiple solutions in the in, in other words for the same Euclidean response one can have multiple response functions so the problem is ill posed it's not the forward problem in in a typical sense in a typical deep learning sense where you give image and say whether it's a cat or a dog or, or in a language you say give a text and say you know you want to identify um, a sentiment of the of the text so that's a forward problem but what we are here is what we observe and that observations is determined by something else so we want to go from the observations to the input that actually resulted in, the, in that particular observation this problem is further exacerbated by high noise in the Euclidean response which results in unstable inversions moreover there are problems specific constraints such as smoothness positivity uh, you know we have to we have to guarantee the response is positive and finally the, the the response function has to satisfy Laplace integration so these are all constraints coming from the domain um, from the domain perspective which we need to incorporate that into the into the inversion procedure first and foremost the inversion procedure in a traditional sense if one has to do this in a in a in a simulation setting it's very very expensive so that's why the scientists are interested in developing surrogate model for this inversion problem to that end, we have developed a neural network uh, methodology, which is shown in the figure. So to ensure positivity, we take this Euclidean response and then, and then send that to a mixture of Gaussians to, uh, to model, model that as a mixture of Gaussians, which are then given as an input to the neural network where the actual inversion happens. This neural network actually results in the, in the construction of the response. And on the response, we have to apply the Laplace transform to reconstruct the Euclidean. So the neural network takes an Euclidean and reconstructs the Euclidean, but it, it, it reconstructs the Euclidean from the response and by applying the Laplace transform. The Laplace transform and, and the integral is an, expensive, uh, is an expensive operation. It has nothing to do with neural network. On the other hand, we do have a neural network that can perform the inversion and to ensure positivity uh, positiveness, uh, positive definiteness on the response, we, uh, uh, we include a mixture of Gaussians. So in a sense, we have only uh, with a one component neural network, but the other two are, are non-neural network components, but are also uh, sort of computationally expensive. So we take this and leverage the, mi high, the, the mixed workload uh, training mode of uh, Sambanova and map this architecture into into the Sambanova hardware. For example, the data comes in and they are encoded into a mixture of Gaussians. So one part of PMU and PCUs are allocated for that. And the neural network training, this component is mapped into this, this neural network uh, training component of Sambanova, which is, which is really optimized to do that. And then, uh, and then we have this Laplace transform, and, which is a computationally intensive part. And we also map this into into the PMUs and PCUs. Again, here the advantage is this: there is no context switching, and also the data move from one module to another module without getting back into the main memory. Our third and final use case is large-scale traffic forecasting. The traffic forecasting problem that we are interested in is shown here. Given a road network and a traffic metrics such as traffic flow and speed that were observed through loop detectors or probe metrics or probe, uh, uh, probe devices. We are interested in building a neural network or a surrogate model that takes historic traffic metrics, let's say 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and forecast traffic metrics from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. To that end, we are using Diffusion Convolution Recurrent Neural Network, in short DCRNN, 
the DCRNN captures the spatial correlation here, the traffic network is modeled as a graph, so the spatial correlation as, as a graph, it captures the spatial correlation through uh, diffusion process, and the temporal correlation through recurrent neural network process. So essentially, think of, think of uh, a recurrent neural network uh, instead of matrix multiplication, here you will have a diffusion convolution operation within, um, within the recurrent neural network. So the architecture follows an encoder decoder um, where the encoder takes as an input a sequence of graphs where each graph is a traffic metric or traffic state at time step t and the encoder encodes this historic uh, traffic data and the decoder decodes that to forecast traffic for the next k time steps. We are looking at really large graph. In a recent exercise, we were looking at modeling the entire state of uh, California. To that end, we were, we were using graph partitioning methods to partition the graph into a number of smaller subgraphs because, because the whole The last and final use case is large-scale highway traffic forecasting. The traffic forecasting problem that we are interested in is shown in the figure where given a road network and the traffic observations obtained through loop detectors or probe devices, we are interested in building a surrogate model or a neural network that takes a historic traffic metric such as shown here from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and forecast traffics for future, let's say from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. To that end, we are using diffusion convolution recurrent neural network. In short, it's DCRNN. So DCRNN captures the traffic correlations, both spatial correlations and temporal correlations using graph neural network and recurrent neural network respectively. It follows an encoder-decoder type architecture where the encoder takes a sequence of graphs where each graph represents the state of the traffic at time step t. And the decoder takes that sequence, that is the historic sequence, and then try to forecast what is the traffic metric for the next k time steps. A single DCRNN cannot model large graphs. To address this problem, we are using graph partitioning methods. So for example, in a recent exercise, we use uh, the whole California network. We try to model the traffic uh, of the whole California network with more than 12,000 uh, 12, sensor locations. And in this case, uh, we partition the whole graph into a number of subgraphs using graph partitioning methods, and then use DCRNN for each of that subgraph and then use the combination of all the models to provide forecasts for the entire state. Of course, here we know, even though we use complete graph partitioning up the approaches, uh, we have to take into account the overlapping region, so there is some sort of redundancy that we have to do at the boundary layers. So this is the overarching overall architecture uh, of the graph partitioning-based DCRNN, where we we put each partition in each of these GPUs and then uh, move the data that is specific to that particular partition to that GPU memory and then train each of them in parallel. The first thing that we are trying to do here is to um, uh, take the whole California network and map it and, and try to do this in a single network because pre in, in the GPU we have the memory capacity issues and now the Sambanova with a large amount of memory, we're trying to do this without graph partition, a single network, the whole California network, the whole California network, uh, how can we model this? How can we use all the data within the single network? And the second thing that we are trying to do 
um, is to do uncertainty quantification. So here we are using um, an ensemble approach in which we take the DCRNN and train them with the different initializations. And once we have all the trained model, then we can do predictions from each of this model and look at each of the prediction and compute mean, standard deviation, or whatever the quantile that we want for uncertainty quantification. To that end, we are using this con concurrent application isolation mechanism um, of, of SAMANOVA in which you can run different applications and map them to different, C, uh, different PMUs and uh, PM, um, uh, PM uh, uh, to the different processing units uh, within, within the hardware. So first and foremost, we, we try to use all of them for modeling the large network. And the second thing is try to leverage this mechanism to do uncertainty quantification. Summary. So A for science applications, as I have shown here, are complex. These are all not just end to end. We have different requirements, we have different components, and um, and uh, this novel AI architecture such as SAMANOVA can significantly accelerate AI for science by reducing this context switching and also the data movement. There are many different ways to configure and use um, SAMANOVA and also other AI architectures, and we are exploring how we can optimally use these architectures and how we can uh, you know, find uh, ways to map our deep learning workloads onto these architectures. So some of the challenges that we faced during our exercise, which is still work in progress, uh, but uh, the challenges that we faced, uh, I would like to point out some of them here. Uh, so not AI, all AI for science applications require vision and language. Of course, there are some, there, there, are, there are a significant fraction of applications that are image-based or text-based. But as I shown here, you know, we have applications that, that are graph neural network based, uh, combining graph with time series and, uh, and, uh, and other computationally expensive components that go along with the neural networks or, or even data generation process that goes along with the, with the neural networks. So having the flexibility to, um, to allow these type of uh, custom models, a la custom models will, will greatly uh, enhance our science applications. And also we need uh, a programmable uh, way to map uh, our architectures on these hardwares so that we can experiment with the different types of architectures and, and mapping strategies. Data movement is a bottleneck and will, will be a bottleneck and will always be a bottleneck. So uh, uh, tools to identify data movement bottlenecks and tools that can optimize or, or software stack that can optimize data movement will go a long way in our use cases. Uh, the performance power and the energy trade-offs are not, not discussed so much uh, currently, but eventually this will be a key metric. Um, in, in particular, when we are, when we are thinking about um, a large number of uh, these AI accelerators working um, in a, in a, in a cluster type setting or when we have to move uh, some of these next to um, our facilities, our light source facilities, where we have to do data processing at the, at the place where we, we collect the data. And finally, we have, uh, you know, there is, there is also a significant need for co-design and how to adapt uh, these architectures for various types of uh, science applications. Thank you.